So we'll let everybody have a chance to opt out of the meeting now that it's being recorded. And um, Okay, so everybody, welcome to the first meeting of the Jenkins User Experience um, Special Interest Group. Um, what I want to do is quickly review the agenda, and then I think it might be better if everybody introduces themselves and mentions their interest, and then once that's done, we can kind of loop back and agree on agenda topics just to make sure that everybody's covered. Um, after that, I'd like to just have a discussion on the scope of the user experience special interest group, which I'll do together with Joe Brugin. Um, we're going to review um, cloud-based plans for the UI UX. So part of what's driving this, and I'll talk more about this, is cloud has some quite big plans in this area. This will be driven by myself, by Joe, by Felix Carrega, who's just joined the cloud team. Um, we're going to look at strategies for making changes to the UX without breaking plugins, which Felix will be leading. Finally, I'd like to talk about how often we should do these sessions, reflect on whether it's valuable or not, whether we do this every two weeks or every month. Um, any other business, obviously, at any point, people are free to bring up topics. So. Let's just start with a quick round of introductions because um, I don't know everybody on this call and I'm sure everybody on this call doesn't know me either. So my name is Jeremy Hartley. I'm based in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Um, I've been with CloudBees since the 1st of April. Um, before the 1st of April, I worked um, with various different roles in DevOps. So I worked for a company called CD Labs on a automated deployment product. Before that, I worked um, building a CI CD pipeline for a very complicated product in the uh, internet TV space. So I really cut my teeth on what it means to take a project from being in that classic scenario of having three to four month release cycles where as soon as it lands with your customers, everything being broken to having you know fully automated pipeline going from all the way from unit test to performance testing and all the steps in between. So that's a little bit my background within CloudBees. I'm responsible for Jenkins and the CloudBees Jenkins distribution. Um, one of my special interests is user experience. I mean, one of the things I've wanted to do since I joined is to overhaul the CloudBees, or I'm oh, sorry, excuse me, the Jenkins UX. And um, so I'm really happy that um, we are now restarting this process. So I'm just going to ask Felix, who's next in the uh, video list, to introduce himself. And then we'll go through people one by one. So Felix, who are you? Uh, hi. I'm Felix Queiroga. I'm I'm located in Galicia, northwestern Spain. Uh, I'm the front-end engineer who I, I have joined CloudBees recently. Uh, and I will be working on the Jenkins UI, basically. Um, well, I will talk about this in more detail later. I'm I'm a bit new to con I'm to contributing to Jenkins itself, although I have used Jenkins in the past and I I'm familiar with the pain points of its UI, so I'm eager to help improve the situation. So, but but yeah, I'm happy excited for this project. Thanks. Uh, Baptiste is next in the list of my system. So I hear you, Baptiste. Yeah, so do you hear me, I think? Yeah, correctly, probably. Yes, we do. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'm Baptiste, Baptiste Natus. So um, I've been working uh, on Jenkins uh, since he was called a bit differently, uh, starting with an H a few years ago. Uh, and so I have been doing that for 
probably a bit less than 10 years, and I've joined CloudB three years ago. Uh, since a few months, I've switched it, switched to the dark side uh, in being engineering manager. So I do a bit less developments those days, even if I'm still involved and uh, uh, in Jenkins in general for various reasons, for personal and professional reasons. So, yeah, and I'm uh, here to help and trying to, yeah, keep Jenkins uh, the best uh, CACD server and automation server in the world, I guess. And hi, everyone. Already met Uli and the others already I know. And team, hello. First time we see you in a call. All right, so next to my list is Evaristo. So if you could introduce yourself. Yeah, sure, thanks. I'm Evaristo. I'm based in Malaga in the south of Spain. Uh, I joined CloudBees little uh, more than three years ago. Uh, and I have background as a software engineer. I, I was also sometime working as a front-end engineer. So my interest here uh, basically come from the usability standpoint, because I consider that something basic uh, for, for, for a product to be interesting and successful. And also from the technology point of view, I think nice and great things are happening in the front-end world, especially around the uh, developer tools. So it's it's a lot of, there is a lot of interesting things happening. So that's why I'm interested in this. And I think this is really interesting and nice. So next in my list is Uli Hafner. Um, I'm Uli Hafner. Uh, I'm based in Munich. Yeah. Um, I'm a committer on Jenkins, uh, I think, for more than 12 years now. So um, my interests are I'm the author of the warnings plugin. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I'm yeah, contributing to this plugin yeah, 10 years now. And I'm always trying to improve the user experience for the plugin. And yeah, so I'm quite interested what's happening on the Jenkins side to improve the overall user experience. So maybe we can join our uh, ideas and help to improve Jenkins and our. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thanks. And didn't you recently get elected to the board yeah. or you're in the process of that? Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I'm not sure if it's really official yet, but. Uh, no, I just realized as I said it that I probably spoke before, but uh, yeah. Tim will have to be sworn into silence. I think people inside yeah. Cloud need know <laughs> the information. No, I think it's actually because I, I heard that it's, it's kind of unofficial, but at the same time, from a link <laughs> accessible from every, for, for every border, you can access the ballot or something. So, you know, it's not really private. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> but anyway, many congratulations on that. I'm sure mm -hmm. you make a good addition. And just one last question. Are you you're attending the Jenkins World in Lisbon? Uh, no, sorry. I okay. can't have the time this year. Okay. Next year okay. probably again, but not this year. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. So Tim Jacomb, or how do you pronounce it? Maybe. Uh, hey, uh, stuff. Well, <laughs> Most people pronounce it differently. Uh, Jacob normally, but um, Jacob, I've, okay. Jacob, but I've heard it five different ways, so it doesn't really matter okay. too much. Um, hey, I'm Tim. Um, I've been a user of Jenkins for about five years and a contributor for the last year and a half. Um, maintaining a few plugins for the last year, Slack, configurations, code, and Azure Key Vault. Um, very interested in helping to improve uh, the UX. Uh, I get quite a lot of issues on the Slack plugin with a lot of users and options and I'm doing, doing the best, but um, anything that we can do to help user experience in the Jenkins UI to help guide users would be very useful. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I help uh, lead a team that across um, a few hundred developers using Jenkins for our CD um, platform. Um, and so anything that we can do to help um, make it easier to use for them is great as well. All right. Where do you work at, if you mind me asking? Uh, I work at a company called Kanos, which is a um, 
which is a Irish company, or not, not a company in Northern Ireland. Um, okay. But it's a consultancy. Okay. Right. <sighs> Thank you. All right. So next in my list is Joe Bridgen. Or did you already introduce yourself, Joe? No, not yet. No. Hey everyone, my name is Joe. I'm a product designer, uh, so another, another term being user experience designer at CloudBees, working on Jenkins and Jenkins related uh, products at CloudBees. Uh, really excited to be digging into this topic and to be getting feedback from all of you in the community and, and working together with you on this. Um, I, think, I think that's it. I joined CloudBees back in early 2019. Uh, happy to be here. Okay, great. Adrian is next in the list. Hi, everyone. So I'm Adrian. Uh, I've been around Jenkins for more than 10 years now, uh, when it was named differently. Uh, I've been contributing on plugins mainly uh, for almost as long, um, creating plugins for different companies or supporting or fixing plugins for uh, on uh, consultancy uh, contracts um, and I'm joining here to help make Jenkins a bit better on the UI side and hopefully uh, uh, golden a bit, uh, a bit the, the name of Jenkins on that. Okay. So last that I have here is Carl Schultz. Carl, can you introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Carl Schultz. I am a software engineer at CloudBees. I've been working with Jenkins for, oh, I guess, about four years. I joined CloudBees about three and a half years ago. Uh, and one of the things that was shown to me as a thing that I might be working on would be uh, was, was Blue Ocean, as it turned out. And Ever since then, uh, usability and user experience improvements to Jenkins have been something that I've been really super interested in. And I only just found out about this meeting about 10 minutes ago and thought, well, if I'm gonna be the person that's always asking if we can make things better, I uh, need to also participate in the meeting. So here I am. Oh, great, welcome. So I think that's everybody. If I missed somebody, it's a little bit confusing the list on Zoom, but if somebody was missed, please speak out now. I'll take that as a no. Um, so in terms of the agenda, does anybody want to add a topic that they would like to discuss? It's fine for me. Okay. Anybody else? No. I mean, if something comes up, I mean, I think we have, depending on how long we discuss each item, we potentially have plenty of time, but um, please raise points as they come by. Um, so I'd like to quickly discuss, I, I guess, the scope of the user experience SIG and why are we doing this? I mean, I think the, the main reason why we're doing launching this SIG is that um, We've come to realization over the past year or so that Blue Ocean is not going to be what it originally was promised to be. So the original goal of Blue Ocean was to obviously start out by visualizing pipelines, but it was meant to spread out and you know become the new UX for all of Jenkins. And due to a number of issues, mainly around extensibility, this turned out to be harder than anticipated. And, um, so at some point, um, a decision was made to really rescope Blue Ocean to being just about pipelines. Um, and I think for some aspects of pipelines, Blue Ocean does a really pretty good job, especially around the visualization. I mean, it's not perfect, but I mean, it's something that I know from experiences used by a lot of people and it's not, a candidate to be replaced very quickly. But I think the rest of Jenkins UX looks old. I mean, I remember whenever I used to see Jenkins before I was the product manager, I used to think, wow, this UX could use a bit of love. And, you know, so I think 
what we really need to do now is to really think and we're also getting a lot of feedback from the market slack you know jenkins looks old you know jenkins is ugly you know there's a lot of negativity around this and i think it's even though jenkins is you know the number one devops tool it's a super powerful product which i don't think i need to explain to everybody if the first thing you see is an outdated ux then it just doesn't really give you a good impression of the product so so based on all this i mean we want to start an internal movement in cloudbees to really build a new ux for jenkins we would like to get as much support from the community as possible we want to learn from what went wrong with blue ocean um, one of the things we really need to decide is is there a way to completely overhaul the ux of jenkins and leave no plugin behind or is this something that's simply impractical and impossible and um, if the latter is the case which i'm not haven't decided yet and i'm not sure about but let's say it is the case then what criteria do we do to get you know 90 percent of the plugins to come along with us um, so these are some of the thought processes that have gone into this sig um, Joe, do you want to, or does anybody want to talk? Sounded like someone was going to say something. Anyone want to uh, chime in? Okay. No, I yeah. always have something, but I think Uli maybe, and Uli, I know you've been doing a lot of uh, work around adding things like um, a bootstrap and things like these uh, directly in warnings NG. So, uh, you know, we really mm -hmm. have a lot of experience trying to make things come all and backward compatible. So what do you think about the feasibility of keeping <laughs> every plugin compatible? Uh, you think it's feasible? You think it's desirable? I, I think it is really desirable. <laughs> and and it's, I think uh, we should make uh, or we should provide a tool set for plugin authors and they need to adapt to these changes and not uh, the other way around. Uh, I think Blue Ocean uh, started the other way around to say here is the user interface and let's see how Blue Ocean can integrate with the plugins. But I think we should make it the other way around to say here we have a tool set that everybody can use and then we can give the possibility for each plugin author to rewrite the plugin to the new UI guidelines for instance. Mm -hmm. Right. So, but then you're saying, <clears throat> go on. Go on. Go ahead, Matthew. Go on, Joe. Go ahead. I was going to tell Uli. I mean, so you're saying it's desirable, but still, to say saying something that that's that is music to my ears is like we need to also be conscious that it's going to be hard to keep people <laughs> working without doing anything. But if, if what you're saying is that, you know, we are going to define what's, what's okay, what's not okay to keep things rocking and then plugin author will have to adapt, then I fully agree because, you know, and, and for older plugins that have not been written since five years or whatever, I'm not very confident that we can keep every single plugin, you know, in the Jenkins community working without changing anything while still, you know, keeping Jenkins fully relevant and modern and everything nowadays. It's kind of my concern, so. I was just going to say, Uli, I strongly agree. I'm really glad you pointed that out. And it's not really uh, on the agenda for today, just because it doesn't have any any substance to it yet. But part of the the long term strategy here is certainly providing a toolkit of sorts, uh, development resources, so that um, you know plugin contributors such as yourself and and uh, just everyone in the community has the opportunity uh, to benefit from the investigation that's being done for this project and bring that knowledge into their contributions rather than saying, we've made a change, we've made X, Y, Z changes, hope you can adapt, strongly agree, we'll, we'll be working toward providing tools and, and guidelines and resources around that stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, if I may say, say so, uh, that's also something that I wanted to elaborate. So maybe we can talk about this when, on the, when we are going to, once we talk about plugins in more detail, but I think this is something nice to mention about phases in the, on the Google document. It says we have different phases. Uh, the first is the CSS overhaul. So the first, I think 
our first goal is making the AI relevant. But I think we can all agree that in the long term, having a at the, anywhere from a UI library to maybe only guidelines, it is necessarily it is necessary to help plugin maintainers keep the UI consistent. Yeah. And I guess we'll talk on, on point number four. We'll get into it in just a second. But just to add on to what Jeremy was saying about the nature of this this SIG, right? Jenkins user experience is obviously a, a huge topic. Um, and this is, so this won't be a, uh, at least the current thinking is this won't be like a, a temporary SIG that lasts a couple months and then maybe we move on to other priorities. This is gonna be a long-term topic and therefore a long-term uh, sort of group and meeting. And we're gonna start in with, and we'll get into the phases in a second, but we're gonna start in with, with more aesthetic stuff and then get into tackling. Uh, deeper user experience and usability issues, but but that's all I had to say on that for now. But I mean, just one question for Uli. I mean, let's just assume that we come up with some guidelines, we come up with a kit, and you know, you need to let's say on average a plugin developer needs to invest one day worth of work to make their plugin work with the new UI. Obviously, some of them will need to do nothing, and others will probably need to do a week's work. What percentage, my concern, I guess, is that 10, 20% of the plugins will come along and at least initially for the first year or two, 80% or more of the plugins will be left behind. Or, or what, what's your feeling about this? Or do you think that, <laughs> I guess this is my concern. I mean, this is the, this is the biggest problem we have, I guess. Is, uh, yeah, I, I think we already have 50% of our plugins which are left behind because nobody's caring about them anymore. Right. So, so these plugins will, yeah, we have we have some stages. Maybe we can say so. We have a stage of quality plugins which are maintained very. Mm. Uh, yeah. That that's really interesting because that thinking we we touched on recently again because you may remember the essentials Jenkins essentials are really called, and then Jenkins Evergreen. Within Evergreen, there was something about these defining essential plugins that would be like higher quality plugins, like in a short list of you know things that are done more than than the others, and yeah, I think it's it's something maybe that could be leveraged around that really indeed um, to, to, to designate the plugins the community commits to maintain over time and there's a long long tail of, of plugins with let's say 100 installation mm -hmm. uh, that probably if they need to be adapted won't be or you know just maybe later or whatever mm -hmm. I guess I mean maybe this is looking too far into the future but I mean it, it would be nice if if let's say there was some kind of fallback mechanism that you know to look good you have to follow these guidelines if you don't follow these guidelines it's not going to look good but it's still going to work mm -hmm. um, rather than you cannot use this plugin anymore or you can only use it in kind of headless <clears throat> mode almost you know because yeah. that's obviously a very dangerous move if we're going to do that mm -hmm. Um, in Blue Ocean, I think we had this uh, exit button where Blue Ocean could be exited to this old user interface. Yeah, I think if we have right. a little bit more uh, moderate that we have the few with the new plugins and then we have a link where you see the results of the old plugins, for instance. So you don't need to enter a new mode in Jenkins, but you can still see the old results, but not in the new user interface, for instance. This yeah. Nice. Yeah, I, I think it, it's something that we will need to look into. At the same time, I am not fully convinced that you know the the level of cost of energy to maintain some things that anyway are, for instance, de facto dead for for a few plugins that are used by you know like installed forty times around the world. Yeah. Um, 
So, you know, I'm wondering if it's not even better to consider, you know, adapting like 50 plugins, like it was done for the security problems, like the security 400 or 200, I'm not sure, you know, the whitelisting instead of blacklisting. There's a few things like this where many, many dozens of plugins were patched. Mm -hmm. But I'm not actually sure that we need to break everything. I'm just thinking that like related to the, the blog that Kosuke wrote two years ago, maybe, the shifting years one, saying that, to keep Jenkins relevant, we need to accept to, um, I wouldn't say break because that's not a goal, but if some things get broken because we keep Jenkins relevant and keep Jenkins great, and even newcomers don't feel what we're discussing right now, uh, you know, we will have won and, and I guess having a few plugins that still need to be adapted to be usable uh, anew uh, will be uh, kind of a detail, I guess. Yeah. Well, I'm happy Mark. to be challenged. So anyway, um, Joe or Felix, do you want to give an overview of just, just to keep time in mind? I mean, do you want to give an overview of the kind of plan we've got for moving towards the new UX at high level? Sure. At a, at a super high level, right, we have what's laid out on screen there. So this, this first, our initial investment, our, our initial investigation here is around a CSS-based visual overhaul. So this would not be solving a lot of the fundamental usability challenges that we encounter in Jenkins right now. This is actually more about updating the aesthetic of, of Jenkins, making it look more modern, which as we know, does actually impact and improve usability, um, but it's not about solving those deeper issues just yet. Uh, when we are able to, to successfully roll those, roll those improvements out, we can begin investigating uh, fixes and improvements that are more fundamental to Jenkins, that long-term architecture, defining that strategy and, and working toward that, which I, I personally expect will take us you know, a, good, a good amount of time. This is going to be a lengthy process, but the idea is that um, we can improve the aesthetics and, and at least have Jenkins look more modern, feel more modern, and therefore be a little bit easier to use uh, in the meantime with phase one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <clears throat> definitely. And to do that, we will try to make sure. So, and we expect that what we do is we are, we are going, we want to maybe err on the side of caution. We want to make sure we want to learn from our previous mistakes. We want to, be innovative, try to not break stuff and mm -hmm. and yeah, be be really careful and try to be sort maybe surgical when whenever we try to make changes. And this is something when I go, for example, this is something that I'm going to mention. Well, so also about point five, we, for example, we will try to start working on components that have no input from plugins, maybe the headers, maybe stuff, and then move on to more complex stuff. So we can st uh, start seeing benefits from the get-go. And we also want to be releasing often. Maybe we we will make the new interface opt-in, but we want plugin maintainers and people to test and their combination of plugins on the new UI as soon as possible to help us catch any any possible issues, which will happen. <laughs> issues will occur, uh, appear, but we are really open to community feedback and to community. And um, if somebody sees a plugin breaking, please do report do report it to us. We will appreciate it. Absolutely. And one, one really important thing mentioned in there as well is uh, this is all intended to be gradual and incremental. We want to be improving the Jenkins UI continuously, and we know that we're going to need to iterate, but certainly we don't want grand reveals uh, that are going to suddenly result in a lot of breakages and things like that. Um, so, so part of the purpose of this uh, recurring call, as we will have it for the Jenkins UX SIG, is anytime we want to introduce uh, an aesthetic change within phase one will bring it to, to the community via this call and the forums and the other communication outlets. And, and obviously, you know, like you mentioned, Felix, seek your feedback. 
Um, and, and that will help inform what actually is implemented. Sorry, was someone going to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to ask uh, about this process and its relation uh, to Jenkins enhancement proposals. So we have for phase one when uh, there are uh, relatively minor changes. Um, it's perfectly fine to do it without jibs. But if we talk about architecture changes or major uh, changes or potentially breaking changes, then uh, you should likely be a Jenkins enhancement proposal. Awesome. Yeah. So it's uh, just for you to keep in mind. So yeah, this uh, special interest group is a great venue for initial discussions and for building consensus. Uh, but if you talk about uh, serious changes, then it's like the about jobs. Yeah. Solid reminder. Thank. You. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think that's. Uh, so I mean, when it comes to the sort of timelines for this, I think it's also worth being, you know, cognizant. I mean, I think the CSS overhaul is probably three to six months of work. Um, defining the long-term architecture will probably be starting in parallel with this. Once the CSS overhaul is somewhat underway, we're going to start working on the long-term architecture. And I think the complete UI overhaul is at least two years worth of work, to be honest. I don't think that, you know, I don't think there's any quick fix here that's available. And yeah. I think, I mean, I'm doing my best to make this as clear as possible to my management. Um, who are, of course, you know, wanting to get results in three months or six months and mm. not in, you know, two to three years. But I mean, I think just the reality of this type of project, and I've been through this on a number of products before in my life, both as a developer and a product manager, is that it takes much, much longer than you think. And there isn't really a very good way of speeding these things up a lot either. I mean, it can be obviously I think things like the plugin work or some work can be parallelized, but um, mm -hmm. it's not very easy to get 120 people and to give them all, you know, one little widget each and then mm -hmm. expect something great to come out of it at the end. It all magically works together. So one comment slash uh, suggestion for this special interest group. Um, mm -hmm. There are already some plugins which I intend uh, changing Jenkins themes. Uh, for example, um, a simple theme plugin uh, yeah. for which there are dozens of uh, public uh, themes in open source and some themes are really good. Basically, they use existing uh, Jenkins uh, structure and they can, uh, just apply new CSS or JavaScript. And it's a kind of existing engine uh, which got a lot of adoption. So for phase one, it might make sense to just uh, take a look at the existing themes and yeah. maybe, well, just uh, speaking bluntly, we can take one of a theme uh, uh, Jenkins community likes and uh, replace uh, the default theme and uh, just create a classic theme for the existing UI. So yeah, it's uh, phase one. It might, yeah, it's phase one. Yeah, it might uh, save you some time. Yeah. yeah. So that's there's... perfect because that's exactly what people already have proposed. Uh, yeah, so... sorry, I just missed the uh, uh, 30 minutes. So yeah. No, no, no. I mean, it's been discussed here and there for a few times. Yeah. Obviously, it's been, you know, one. Uh, obvious thing like trying to basically make Jenkins default Jenkins behave more like some good things uh, inside the theme plugin but maybe I'm going to actually leave Joe uh, discuss this a bit more because he's the UX expert here so he will probably have more to say around mm -hmm. those potential improvements that we can do on Jenkins itself. So I love the efficiency of the idea right um, but there's a, a bit of a danger there too where we don't want necessarily to just be picking up uh, theme, themes or themes or styles that currently exist because in the long term that sort of can inhibit our ability to form a proper design language for Jenkins. Uh, so additional components that we're redesigning and implementing in the coming months throughout phase one will have to be informed by the design and style choices that have been made for those themes. And that's not to knock those themes at all, um, but, it, but it does 
it does sort of restrict um, the uh, the uh, ability to, to create a, a unique design language and an aesthetic for Jenkins. Mm -hmm. right? That yeah. could affect sort of the, the overall cohesion. And I'd hate for us to be in a situation in the future where we sort of stepped on our own feet in that way, even though it could save mm -hmm. us time up front. Um, yeah. So if we think about themes, that the most of themes just don't have any design decisions because uh, they are basically just a CSS replacement. <laughs> uh, there are some JavaScript based themes where it's quite different. Uh, but yeah, that's why I mentioned it uh, as a potential because it's exactly phase one uh, you mentioned without any other such changes. Yeah, and I think the phase one uh, idea yeah. around making purely high level, like simple things uh, changes um, is a good thing also because maybe you would create. Um, you know, desire, uh, traction from the community to see, you know, Jenkins is already evolving, already changing phase, already being nicer. And maybe we would have more people from the community actually come here and then we can, you know, enter deeper uh, surgery changes and everything. Mm -hmm. and so there, there, and the simple theme plugins from my understanding from them is that the themes are a special kind of community items that is really difficult not to break. Uh, maybe not in this first phase, but the plugins are, the way the plugins define the CSS is tightly coupled to the HTML generated. Yeah, so phase two, you will break themes. And I would say that uh, don't uh, let it stop you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Sorry, please. Can you can you? Yeah. So themes are really tied to the current CSS, and of course you cannot move Jenkins design forward without breaking them. And uh, Jenkins project doesn't define any compatibility uh, for, for uh, the layouts and for the structure. So basically, even now in weekly releases, we are free to break uh, the structure of layout uh, as much as we want. So obviously we don't uh, want uh, to break it just because, but uh, there is no practical re restrictions. And yeah, I understand your concern and I just don't think it's an, a real obstacle for phase two. Yeah, that doesn't mean that we are going to intentionally break them. We will yeah. when possible and when it's, I don't know, uh, when possible we will try to walk around the existence of, of the themes. I'm actually being inspired by, by them, but, but yeah, thank you for for mm -hmm. pointing that out. So when it comes to uh, actual stylization and aesthetics of the UI, like creating a, you know, a defining a color palette and a typography, um, for example, iconography throughout Jenkins, all of that stuff will, will be created um, from scratch to, to, so that we can eventually have in the Jenkins design language is consistent um, rather than picked up from a current theme. If we can utilize some of the uh, infrastructure and some of the code that, that goes into making themes possible, that's totally um, sounds like a, a great thing from my perspective, but, but as far as stylization goes, we want to build this right uh, and, and create it from scratch in that regard. I might be, I think I'm on a slightly different topic than the rest of you, but I just wanted to clarify that point real quickly. Yeah. Was somebody saying something? I think you were kind of distant there. All right, I think everybody should have access to the document now. Sorry, I didn't get that set up quite right, but. Yeah, some there was some noise in the background. I don't know, but anyway, maybe not some, maybe not somebody trying to talk. Maybe in the background of Oleg or something. Maybe uh, I'm on the worst now. <laughs> yeah, Swiss people are very noisy. Well, it's not Swiss people. <laughs> yeah, and you know him pretty well. You know, a French speaking one? <laughs> Some would. Okay, maybe we, we can, now we are talking about plugins, we can talk about 
sort of the development process, which will be basically based around breaking as few uh, plugins as possible. So we are going, as I mentioned before, we are going to be prioritizing changes based on different priorities, for example, whether removing some piece of the UI can help us free and remove a library after making sure it's not used by plugins. Secondly, trying to change, we will focus on changing stuff where we can, where we are confident UI elements that have no contributions from plugins, for example, maybe headers or breadcrumbs versus the config forms. The config forms are, those are more delicate. And we will also, a concern we have, uh, something we will try to avoid is um, having, we will we want to minimize inconsistency in the UI where the new elements clash visually with uh, the old elements on the page. So um, we will probably iterate, it's going to be, it's, Probably we are going to do several iterations. Maybe we start working on the header and then we revisit the header in a few months from now once we have uh, more updated more UI elements. So this is the way we thought we were going to prioritize the plugins. Is there any input about this? Does anybody have any suggestions? For me, okay. one thing, uh for serious changes is about REST APIs. So what I do not see in the current plan is what would be the architecture of new UI. Uh, do you include a major rework of Jenkins APIs uh, into this phase? Uh, or do you plan to build uh, the new UI on the top of existing APIs? Um, I think this is a really good question that obviously we're going to be defining during the long-term architecture. But I mean, I think it's good that we talk about it now. Cause I mean, what, yeah. I mean, I think these are exactly the things we need to decide. I mean, mm -hmm. in my opinion, we need to have a full new UI for Jenkins. That's a modern UI that's based on, you know, the clear separation between front end and back end. And for me, one of the goals of this is that, um, Elements of the UI should be embeddable inside other products, you know, mm -hmm. so that you can, for instance, to name something controversial inside of GitHub Actions, you should be able to show, you know, a little bit of a Jenkins pipeline or, you know, inside mm -hmm. the flow product that CloudBees has just bought to make a more commercial example, we should be able to show a little bit of the Jenkins UI, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, it's definitely doable. So they think that it's not how the current Jenkins UI is designed. Yeah. Because the most of Jenkins front end, except a few plugins like uh, Warning Squad in by Uli and uh, other similar ones, they use server side generation of pages. So what you need to keep in account when you work on this project and that for many things, there is just not no REST API. And basically in Jenkins, we don't have uh, documentation for uh, REST API, so you just have to look uh, into the code. Yeah, there is a JSOC project for generating open API or Schwager, uh, but it's uh, not uh, yet implemented. Yeah, I think the current idea that really there there would be a phase one at least or something like this mm -hmm. uh, whatever we call it that would be more around what we, we we've called somehow css only changes mm -hmm. uh, but like trying to have you know kind of high impact in the very short term trying to fix uh, what is uh, Maybe not only low hanging fruits, but things that are obvious and, you know, that would at least first, you know, start fixing things that make Jenkins, uh, you know, look like old at first sight. And I think we can do have, have an impact on that in the very short term. And then, uh, as Jeremy is saying, I think that, that what Jeremy is referring to in like two years long plan is indeed trying to do 
as we go get getting bolder and bolder we get community traction we get people you know complaining uh being happy uh we try to see what we can do what is succeeding what is uh breaking everything uh, trying to maybe release on a weekly basis very very iterative so we do, we avoid blowing up everything you know after a very very long tunnel so but yeah uh do, i do not see so to, in other words i do not really see the rest api uh as the very very first thing we need to do but yeah. because to kind of start having something like a, you know mm. being visibly initiative that's even an impact but yeah in the mid-term uh, uh short shortish mid term i think it does make a lot of sense yeah I'm not sure whether it's possible to build it i mean if you're going to have a ui that's ultimately based on rest apis you probably need to have that api up front i mean yeah, that's why I would rather think about yeah. phase two, not phase three, because long-term architecture is a uh, definitely a place where you define uh, the new concept. I think it. I think this is something that maybe it's a bit too early to talk now, maybe, mm -hmm. because there are many ways. There are definitely more ways to improve Jenkins UI, make it using more modern tools that there mm -hmm. were three years ago, four years ago, when BlueOcean was created. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, there are more use technologies. That said, I think it's something that really, really warrants a high level of research. Mm -hmm. that, uh, that I think that's what this said. Uh, our, our, our first effort will be uh, focusing on doing low effort or lowest effort possible high impact visual changes while planning for the for the other stuff mm -hmm. but not necessarily focusing on the actual planning just put the suggestion because it's not necessarily yeah. the rest API. Uh, okay. yeah what i mean is that basically it's unlikely server side thing anymore yeah, who knows? I mean, I think the key thing is there's a separation, you know, between it's not a monolithic API anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not a monolithic UI, but you know. So, I mean, one result of this could be that we have, you know, hundreds of different sub UIs that, you know, used in different contexts, whether this is, you know, part of, you know, company's own sort of overall. You know, DevOps pipelines, they just show a little bit of Jenkins, you know, because they're pulling stuff from the APIs, and, and that's, you know, the way modern UI should work. You know, Jenkins is not a monolithic, you know, thing either. It's a part of a whole chain, you know, DevOps, and people will want to visualize that in different ways. So I think it's important to, that this is possible. I mean, I think it's mm -hmm. an important key objective of this new UI work is that, you know, we're not just thinking about Jenkins as a standalone thing anymore. It's uh, something bigger than that. Um, looking at the time, we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty sure we can talk a lot longer, but I just wanted to, first of all, touch on the topic of um, how often should we do this sessions? The, and do people think that they're valuable? Should we do it every two weeks? Or should we do it once a month? Um, what's the format of this session? Is this working? Well, we've only done it once, so maybe it's a bit too soon to say is it working, but uh, just any feedback about that? Anybody can speak or comment. My personal inclination is that we would it would be good to start off doing this as a monthly call and then we can certainly adjust and make it more frequent if we if we want to but that's just my two cents all right so let's tally monthly or two weekly i think is the two options um, mm -hmm. we have one vote for monthly does anybody else want to vote for monthly or two weekly? yeah i think, I, think I, I agree with the approach yeah mm -hmm. for me it's good too uh, I, mean, I assume if if we're communicate if we're meeting monthly that means there must be an very much communication outside the meeting yeah yeah 
there you, will need to be. I don't. I don't think that's set up yet, Mark. Um, but yes, you're absolutely right with regards to this SIG. It shouldn't just be a monthly update. The, the this call would just be where we did do the most discussion face to face, so to speak. But yeah, we got to set up mm -hmm. other communication. Element. To be honest, I would rather have a more frequent call, but shorter one. I mean, we are doing continuous things, right? So. And so having a 30 minute call every two weeks instead of one hour every month, I think is slightly uh, maybe better to keep the ball ro the balls rolling, but I'm fine with whatever people think uh, would be better at this stage. You know, we are still getting started. So, you know, trying to impulse some, some rhythm is maybe better at this stage at least, but just me, just yeah. my opinion. I agree with that list. I, and I believe that if we do it monthly, we will make the risk of just doing demos while doing it two week, uh, once every two weeks. It will make uh, discussions easier. Yeah, my feeling is that we need to get a rhythm going. And I also feel that if we do two weeks, it's okay for people to miss a session or two. If it's monthly and you kind of miss one or two sessions, then you're almost out of the game. That's a good point. Jack I'm. This is Carl. I'm a plus one on every two weeks. It would make it that much less likely for me to forget. Yeah. Sounds like we got an answer. Works for uh, me. We can always iterate if we need to, but those are all really good points. So sounds yeah. good. Okay. Um, is anything anybody would like to discuss in the last five yeah. minutes? Yeah, I would like to ask something, which is um, ideally we want to to work soon, as, uh, and as somebody mentioned, there's still bound to be commun offline communication. So I was going to I was going to suggest maybe we can uh, we start thinking about our proper feedback channels where we can propose UI changes. Yeah, actually, uh, so I think it was already proposed by Oleg, and and it does ah. make sense to reuse the Jenkins Dash UX mailing list that's already existing, isn't it? And there's even a, a IRC channel, even if that one probably is getting less tractions nowadays. Nowadays, mm. but I mean, yeah, so I'm, I'm, Oleg. IRC chat could be just moved to Gitter or whatever. Though I'm not a big fan of Gitter either. Is it possible that we could create a Slack workspace? Um, we could create Slack workspace in the continuous delivery foundation. Uh, so we had a discussion with CDF uh, and we can host project channels there if there is interest. Um, so if somebody wants to try it, uh, you could uh, do that. But yeah, for the record right now, none of Jenkins resources is Hosted within uh, Slack, and there are strong opinions uh, from some contributors about Slack. So, sorry, what are the strong, what are the negatives about Slack? That it's a commercial company, I guess. Or? Uh, yeah, something like that. But yeah, yeah basically, it's up uh, to the special interest group to define a channel which is uh, which suits uh, the special interest group uh, the most. So personally, mm -hmm. I don't care because I'm uh, in CDF Slack anyway. Uh, it's maybe a question uh, for team, for Uli, and for other people who are not in CDF Slack. Or I, would, local. I would prefer Slack. Anybody have an issue with Slack? Uh, Uli, you are muted. Uh, I've never used it, so. <laughs> Pretty easy. Pretty you can help. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I have, you have a lot of RAM on your uh, machine, but yeah. It's got a way better recently. Yeah. So shall we try, I mean, obviously people can reuse the Jenkins UX mailing list exists. I've announced this group on there. I mean, it's not, there's hardly any traffic on it. So it would be easy to use that, but we can try Slack as well. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to try that if, if you can. You can take the action to create that Slack. Well, basically, anybody can create it in the CDF. You don't need special permissions. Okay. One thing that uh, you should 
probably confirm it in the general room before doing so. But yeah, any member of CDF Slack can just go ahead and create a new channel. How do you how do you join it? I'm on the website and can't find a link to Slack. Uh, yeah. Just a second, I'll find the link. Anyway, I think we can handle those things maybe asynchronously with actually more, well, maybe <laughs> we have more people complaining, but um, uh, for more visibility in the end on Jenkins Dev for now or even Jenkins Dash UX and, you know, pinging people about the fact that we are switching conversation on Jenkins Dash UX mailing list for now. Um, my personal preference is that I do not really, really mind about the uh, instant messaging channel we would use, but I I am not a huge fan of using uh, such tools for asynchronous compatible messaging and discussions, like instead of many links, basically. But yeah, yeah. that's how it's quite young people do yeah. that nowadays. Uh, we know the CDF Slack is paid, or does it mean that we have a limit of 10,000 messages? Sorry? You know the CDF Couldn't hear you. Slack? You're going very far. Yeah. Sorry, do you know if the CDF Slack is paid Slack or is it no, limited it's, uh, to... free account? I just right. checked. So right now they have 1,000 messages uh, used. So you have mm -hmm. 9,000 left. But after that, uh, interesting things will start happening. Yeah. Yeah, there's also that, yeah. yeah. So it's just for the people that don't understand the... Uh, Free Slack, at certain point, your messages will start rolling over. So old messages, will, so it means that it's only ephemeral. Mm. Mm -mm. Maybe less than ideal, or we would pay. I don't know, I'm not sure Jenkins, Jenkins project has budget for paying hundreds or, or thousands of euros or dollars for. Yeah, well, it's sort of a question to CDF. Uh, they declared intent to deploy Slack. Uh, but yeah, yeah, right. I'm not sure what's uh, the plan uh, about switching to enterprise account there. Yeah, we should reach out to CES to ask basically what we do when basically the communities are losing their messages, and you know the the the, the most the more active a community is, the quickest the quicker that thing is going to happen. So it's it's pretty not great. Yeah, we had a discussion about the. Uh, Mattermost or Rocket Chat or whatever in the infrastructure team uh, maybe a couple of weeks ago. But again, it boils down uh, to getting people there and uh, oh. setting uh, everything up. Mm -hmm. yeah, we'll worry about it when we get closer. And it kind of gets down to a, what sort of discussions are you having there? Mm -hmm. and do they need to be there long term? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, there's always, I see always a matter, uh, kind of a, you know, a drift about that saying it's only temporary, like, like messages related to things longer term should be happening there, but that's not what I'm saying all the time. But anyway, that again, that's an aside, we're getting out of time. So uh, that, that's probably something we can discuss, you know, asynchronously or, or even with wider audience again. Uh, anything, I guess, uh, Jeremy, you, I guess we can call the meeting out or something. Is there anything else related to the core intent of today that, that someone would like to raise? What do you think, like, I guess, team and Uli mostly? And because, uh, I mean, the, uh, some, some, if not all of the others were aware of that thing and we would really love to hear what you think. Actually, I don't understand the question. Can you please repeat? I mean, I, I, what I'm saying is that I guess the, the main people who I'm interested to hear feedback from is more like, uh, so you and team more than the other people in the call because uh, we don't, I mean, the people who are not working for CloudBeast basically. Yeah, I think it's quite important what we are doing here. So <laughs> we should continue, yes. <laughs> Uh, just yeah, just keep the messaging going, I guess, and see where we can get involved and where um, can try things out as well, and experiment. Thanks. Uh, I need to drop. Thank you, everybody, for joining. I hope this was valuable, and I'll arrange something in the next two weeks and announce it on the hopefully at the same time in two weeks. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Good to meet you. All.
Cheers. Cheers. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you.